Hello and welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. So for quite some time, I've been wanting to do a documentary series on the early days of Compaq Computer Corporation, but there were three very specific machines that I wanted to be able to show. And I've been on the lookout for these machines for quite some time. Well, I have finally acquired all three of them. Um, unfortunately, all three of them are broken and all three of them do require cosmetic restoration as well. So this is going to be the first of a series of restoration episodes and I'll be starting, oh man, with this guy. Whew. This is the Compact Portable One. Of course, really it's just called the Compact Portable, but we kind of retroactively call it the One to differentiate it from the number two and three. And this is kind of similar to the Osborne in the way that it's packaged. But uh, this machine is kind of special for a few different reasons. Uh, one, I actually knew somebody who had one of these back in uh, my high school time. But this was also the first commercially successful IBM compatible computer, as well as the first commercially successful IBM portable computer. So um, this is a, a pretty interesting piece of history. So I actually picked this computer up a few weeks ago at the retro computer gathering that we do in Dallas periodically. And um, I was told it doesn't work but I have not tried turning it on yet. So let's dig into this thing. Taking a look at the exterior of this thing, it's pretty dirty all over. However, it doesn't look like anything that will be hard to clean and I don't even think it needs any Retrobrite. I'm not quite sure what to do about the thread coming off this leather handle though. However, taking a look at the keyboard, things may be different here. Uh, the keys definitely look like they need Retrobrite. So that should be fun. But on the bright side, it isn't missing any keys. Well, I guess we should plug this thing in and see what it does. Well, here goes nothing. I hear a fan, but there's no activity on the screen and I don't hear any beeps or movement of the floppy drives. I'll check the brightness. No difference. Okay, I think we can assume it's dead. Let's see if we can revive it. So there are five internal snaps to remove this cover and what you need to do is pop the first one and then place something in there like another screwdriver to keep it from snapping back down and then go over to the next one and repeat. Eventually, when you get to the last one, the panel will come off. It looks like there's already a broken snap and I don't see the plastic piece anywhere laying around so I think this was snapped a long time ago, but all the rest of them seem to be good. This thing is pretty neat. It looks like each function of the computer has its own little metal cage and cover. Uh, so this will get you access to the card sockets. Uh, this is the CRT screen and this section is for the disk drives. And it looks like they're mounted on little rubber shock absorbers, which is pretty cool. I wanted to start with the card socket cage, uh, but these are some of the most annoying screws ever. Uh, they're flat tipped, but the slit is too skinny for a decent sized screwdriver to fit. And I just wasn't having any luck with these things. So I tried a nut driver. And while I had better luck with that, it was still difficult to remove these things because there isn't much to grip onto. If the heads were just a little bit taller, then that would have helped a lot. Okay. Well, let's remove the top cover. So, unlike other portable computers, uh, this one is really just like a desktop in that it has five ISA expansion sockets. And four out of the five slots are filled. Next, I'll remove this HV panel. A lot of these covers are just designed to slide off if you loosen the screws a bit. And there we go. I'll also remove this bottom case cover. The first troubleshooting step I always take in the case of a dead computer is to remove anything that isn't essential, so I'll start with this. It appears to be some kind of networking card. IBM Multinet Interface. Never heard of this. <laughs> uh, next thing is uh, what appears to be a parallel port card. Next up is an old MFM hard drive controller card. Alright, so I notice there's this little LED power indicator on the motherboard, but watch what happens when I power this thing up. Yeah, it flashes real quick and then you hear the fan come on. And I noticed the fan itself is powered from AC power so it really isn't indicative of the power supply working. So I'm going to measure the voltage at the board. See that? When I power it on, uh, there's a short burst of power and then it dies, uh, just like with the LED. Okay, so I'm going to keep disconnecting stuff and uh, this is the cable that runs the internal monitor. So I'm going to remove the video card and then I'm going to remove the floppy card. And then I'm just going to unplug the power to the floppy drive and the hard drive. The idea here is I think the capacitors and the power supply are weak and I want to reduce the load on the power supply. Okay, here's the power LED again. Let's try the power. Hey, we have power. Of course, we aren't going to see anything on the screen because there's no video card. 
so let's stick the CGA card back in there. However, nothing happened. In fact, uh, we're back to the flashing LED again. I felt like maybe the power supply was weak, and there just wasn't enough amps to get past that initial starting phase. And I really wanted to see if the motherboard worked before going any further, so I got the crazy idea to use another power supply and sort of jumpstart the thing by giving it a few extra amps. I even asked a few other experts if uh, this would be a bad idea, and nobody could think of a good reason not to. I used some paper clips and just bent them into the right shape so that I could jump all four leads from the two power supplies. Yeah, I think that'll work. Okay, I'll start by firing up the external supply. Yikes! So that was a bit unexpected. <laughs> Let's watch that again. It looks like a tantalum capacitor on the video card exploded. And you can see it right there. Uh, you can also see the black mark it left on the metal bracket and even on the pin headers above it. Here's the interesting thing. Now that the capacitor blew, the power supply actually starts up every single time now. Uh, however, I'm still not getting any video. And uh, I decided to test the voltages again, and this time I'm getting a steady 5.1 volts, which is maybe just a bit high, but I don't think it would be a problem. And uh, the other rail I'm getting 12.4 volts. Again, a little high, but probably not an issue. Alright, so I had to sleep on this, and now it's morning, and it's time to get back to work. Now, let's just take an overview of where we're at in this troubleshooting situation. Uh, first of all, I thought the problem was the power supply, and apparently it wasn't. Apparently the problem all along was this tantalum capacitor on the CGA card was shorted, and I guess the power supply in here was simply too weak, or its protection circuit was too precise to allow the current to flow through, where uh, this power supply just barreled the power right on through until this thing blew out. Interestingly enough, power supply is working fine in here now, and every time I fire this on, there is proper voltage at the motherboard and at the Molex connectors for the floppy drive and the hard drive. So I think the power supply may be good, but there's still three wild cards, and that is, does this CGA card work? I looked at this capacitor, and it only appears to connect to this external header here, and it doesn't appear to be anything critical on this card, so... I don't think that capacitor is a critical component, but I'm still not getting any video, either on the external or the internal monitor. So that raises the questions of, does this card work, does the motherboard work, and does the internal CRT work? Um, I can tell you this, when I fire the computer on now, I see that the heater is on the back of the CRT is glowing now, which is a good sign that does tend to indicate the CRT may be working. So how do we troubleshoot this? Uh, well, we need to do a process of elimination. Now, I don't have a replacement motherboard that I can try, but I did make some phone calls last night, and I made a late night run over to my friend DJ's house, and he had these. Now, these are CGA cards, but they're not just any CGA cards. They actually happen to be compact CGA cards with an internal header uh, for running one of these internal monitors. Now, you may notice it's a, it's a little bit shorter than the original card. I think this is from maybe the second generation of these compact portables, so it's a little bit more compact. A lot of the chips are more consolidated. So, uh, but in theory, it should work. So I'm gonna stick this card in there and let's see what it does. The internal header is in a different place, but I think the cable will reach, and it does. So there we go. Uh, let's try it again. Nothing. Still no video, no beeps, no signs of life. I also tried it on an external monitor just to be sure. Uh, still nothing. The next thing I want to do is try one of these postcards. And no, I'm not talking about a postcard you send in the mail, but uh, POST stands for Power on Self Test. And this particular one is designed to work in an ISA slot or a PCI slot. And then it has a readout for any error codes from the BIOS. Also, it has these little LEDs over here, which will show you all of the voltages and all the other information about the bus, including the reset line, so you can see if that's stuck or not. So, I'm going to stick this down in the last slot, so that there will be easy to see what is displayed. Well, everything looks good, except there are no codes and uh, still no activity. Well, it's time to remove the motherboard. Uh, the way you do this is to remove this little panel, so that we can disconnect the power supply and the keyboard. And the board simply slides out like so. Well, here it is. Uh, the board is somewhat smaller than I expected. I'm a little mystified what these empty ROM sockets are for. I'm hoping I'm not missing something important there. 
I'm going to go ahead and reseat all of the socketed ICs. Uh, I'm not going to remove them, I'm just going to pry them up a tad bit and push them back down in. I'll also do all the RAM chips. Speaking of, I noticed this one here in a socket. Makes me wonder if this RAM chip has been replaced before. I also noticed something else. Check this out. Uh, this trace here is burned. Uh, this is most likely the 5 volt rail for the ISA sockets. So I thought I should test continuity on the ISA sockets and yep, it appears there is a break right in the middle. It looks like the three slots on the end here are the only ones getting power. So I tried the postcard again in one of the dead sockets and sure enough you can see the LED for 5 volts is not lit up. So that socket is essentially dead until I repair it. So I thought I should try sticking the video card in one of the good sockets. And fortunately the internal video cable does reach, but still no dice. The computer is still dead. Okay, so I went to see my friend Raymond, who is like the Jedi Master of Electronics Repairs, and uh, we were going to look at to, uh, repairing this board. And uh, he did look at it briefly, however, things kind of took a little bit of a turn when he was digging around on his shelf. I ended up finding this, which is actually the exact same board that goes on one of these compact machines. I don't know where it came from. He said he's had it there for years. Uh, the only problem is he noticed that there was some uh, damaged traces here, probably from uh, something scratching it really deeply. So he added these uh, little patch wires on there to uh, solve that problem. But uh, we fired this board up on the bench and it did work. Okay, also some news on uh, the CGA card. This is the original CGA card, and um, this is the one that had the capacitor that blew up. Now, uh, when he actually tested this, he found that it was still a short, and the short was actually on the 12 volt line, not the 5 volt line. So what that means is that means that the trace on the motherboard actually ended up burning out before the capacitor did. He ended up replacing this capacitor, and we tested this on the bench as well, and this card is now working. Speaking of capacitors, remember these two cards that I picked up from my friend DJ? Well, it turns out one of them worked and one of them didn't, and um, I think this is the one that didn't work, and it also had a capacitor that was shorted. It was one of those same little tantalum capacitors, and, uh, and so he replaced that, and now all three of these CGA cards are now working. However, um, even though this board did fire up and uh, we couldn't get any further because we didn't have any disk drives or anything connected to it, uh, but uh, there are some interesting differences in this board. Uh, first of all, it has a NEC V20 processor installed instead of the Intel 8088. And uh, it's a fully compatible processor. In fact, it's actually just a little bit superior. So I guess we'll just leave that in there. However, uh, when it comes to RAM, that's where we've got a problem because uh, this board only has uh, 256K of RAM uh, because these are 4164 chips and the other board had 41256 chips in it. So I'm going to remove the RAM chips from this first board here. You know, this is something I haven't done in over 20 years, swapping an entire bank of RAM like this. I mean, believe it or not, this was very common on IBM compatible motherboards of the era, whether they be clones or the real thing. Sims and DIMMs were uncommon on XT class machines and really didn't start to become popular until 386 motherboards. So this was how you upgraded the memory in early PC motherboards, one chip at a time. So this is the factory configuration of this board. It comes with 128K solder to the board and then two rows of expansion so you can put up to 640K total on this board. There are two sets of dip switches on this board. Now my understanding is this switch controls settings regarding uh, things like floppy drives and what kind of video card. Uh, these are used to configure how much RAM is on the board. However, uh, from what I've read, uh, later versions of the BIOS actually ignore these and do a self-test to figure out how much RAM is in, so we'll see how that works. Speaking of BIOS, looking at the BIOS chip on the original board, it mentions copyright up to 1986, which is four years after this machine was designed. But on the new board I just picked up, it goes all the way to 1987, meaning this is probably the latest BIOS ever made for this machine. So these are the 4164 chips I pulled out of the new board, and I'll definitely hang on to these as I believe they're compatible with the Commodore 64 and Apple II machines, among others. Anyway, so the next thing I need to do is remove this metal bracket from the old board, and then install it on the new board. And then I can install the board into the computer. I'm going to go ahead and use the original CGA card, so at least something of this will be original, right? Well, let's power it up. Well, all we get is an error message on the screen. Still, I'll take that over what we had before, which was nothing at all. Looking through the service manual, it appears to be a RAM error, and it's telling me there's a problem with Bank 2 Data Bit 7. So, I don't have any spares. I think for the moment, I'm just going to put the old RAM back in there. 
So here we go again, this time with the old RAM. OK, well, uh, now we're getting a different error message. I'm not sure if this is progress or not. It says it's a disk error, but uh, let me try inserting an MS-DOS boot disk and let's just see what happens. OK, and you can see the LED on the disk drive light up, but it still didn't help any. Same message. OK, so time to disassemble the disk drive. One thing I noticed right away is that the head would barely move at all. It took a lot of force to move it. So the first thing I did was to re-lubricate everything and then uh, I started working the head back and forth until eventually it became easy to move. And I suspect this was the source of the disk error since the head couldn't seek or return to track zero where the sensor is. So here we go yet again. The drive lights up. I actually hear some activity. I think it's booting. And it did. <laughs> and just while I feel like progress was being made, I discovered yet another problem. The keyboard is completely dead. However, I have to admit I was sort of expecting this. I had been warned about this already. So time to disassemble the keyboard. So take a look at this. Uh, these are little capacitive foam circles on each key. However, you can see that the, just touching them causes them to completely disintegrate. I mean, this stuff is totally gone. Every single key. Um, these will have to be replaced. Still, I wanted to see if the rest of the keyboard works, so I cleaned the PCB contacts and then just tried touching them with my fingers. And I was able to type, but it's really difficult since half the time it shows two or three characters when I touch one of these pads. Nevertheless, I was able to coax it into loading Planet X3. And it looks pretty good in CGA green screen mode. Of course, it's nearly impossible to play without a properly working keyboard. All right, guys, so I have been working on this computer for seven days straight. And I know it doesn't seem that way when you watch a 20 minute video, but uh, yeah, this has been one of the most challenging uh, troubleshooting uh, processes I've had to go through for quite some time. Uh, part of the reason is simply due to lack of experience with this machine and also due to lack of spare parts, which actually it's kind of a miracle that I was able to find the spare parts that I did. So uh, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> However, it looks like I'm gonna be waiting at least another two weeks for delivery on the parts I need to finish restoring the keyboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this away for now and then we'll have a part two video come out when those parts show up and then hopefully uh, we can get this thing completely working. I think we're over the hill, meaning all the hard part is behind us. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this will probably end up being a three-parter because in part three, it will be the actual documentary, kind of like I did on the Osborne. So uh, hope to see you around then and thanks for watching.